Hi guys and welcome to another episode of JDM Masters. I'm Captain Bradford, your host, and on this special series called Time Machine, we're going to be looking at classic JDM magazines in order to find out what was the scene like and some specifications using a lot of the resources which we use in our car reviews uh, for everyone. Now, we're going to be looking at a lot of interesting things, uh, starting with some car catalogs, for example here, uh, R34 car catalog, a lot of them, and some famous magazines which some of you may or may not know about uh, in the tuning industry and tuning world, Hyper Rev uh, with its very nice illustrations. Uh, we'll also be looking at some specialty magazines, uh, for example the GTR magazine which only specializes in GTRs, all of this go all the way back to the 90s. Uh, famous car feature magazine by Best Motoring uh, host or Jay's Tipo. We'll be looking at a variety of different uh, cars and reviews back in the time and also uh, this is very interesting and special motor fan which is focused on the new cars when it first came out and a lot of technical features and so if you'd like to know more about it come join us let's go back to the year 2000 almost 21 years ago from the time of this video issue 89 in summer of june and on this cover page we can see an s800 from the 60s and 1990s Z32 Fair Lady Z uh, the cover story this is going to be an interesting story about the appreciation of some sports cars from the 90s and not forgetting that year 2000 was the turn of the century now, the world was worrying about several things such as the Millennium Bug which was a concern about the numbers uh, going back to zero zero and bank accounts uh, being a bunch of a problem. The year 2000 also saw the introduction of the PlayStation 2 and the following year would see the release of Gran Turismo. Now, understanding also that a lot of these 90s cars had already made their debut and some of these would actually still remain into production until uh, year 2002. So, 90s sports cars were still fresh on the second-hand market. Some of them were getting cheaper and much more affordable. Now let's have a look at this issue and go back in time and see where this brings us. Oh, this is very nice. Here is a first generation Forester STI, which is actually not a real STI, but this was an aero tune unit. As you can see here, low down aero tune by STI. It was not like the SG9, uh, similar to one that reviewed that Albo has. The older model uh, actually had the same WRX engine uh, with the same drivetrain Volk Racing TE37 released not too long ago and advertisements like this were very nice double page spread and always Japanese advertisements make a lot of explanation about the technology or the product itself and here uh, very often they have the all the measurements and the wheel sizes along with the offset and something about the Japanese magazines uh, of course it's going from uh, reverse way to the Western style. Which, oh, and we have Dori Dori himself uh, from the year 2000, looking much younger than he is now, obviously. So he was sponsored up for his racing. Here we come to the first page of the cover story, and it says here in English, We must drive now, a sports car. This was the tail end of the 90s and encouraging people to appreciate sports cars. And that's something very interesting because we still appreciate these 90s sports cars even 20 years later, but not forgetting that these cars were at the prime of their existence and the story is written by popular racing driver at the time and also best motoring host uh, Kinoshita Takayuki who's a regular uh, columnist on this Jay's Tipos magazine and so the first one here talks about a uh, sports car is like a lady and of course you know these sort of references to maybe a design or the curves and uh, how a guy who has these kind of sports cars Oh, of course, you know, keeping it with a high maintenance. It's kind of similar to, you know, having a girlfriend who is like, you know, a model or something. But of course, maybe these won't be applicable now because a lot of ladies do drive this car. Going on to the next page, uh, the next catchphrase here, how sports cars is like a drug. Very nice back shot of the later version, Toyota MR2 SW20 uh, with original wheels. This is also another shot just parked in the Toge, the NSX NA2, 
uh, with the pop-up headlights, the Type S with the optional BBS wheels. And this category is over here. It's a sports car is like a sharp edge knife. And it's interesting to note that the NSX is also one of the cars considered to be a supercar, uh, going by how it's made. Here's the next page. We can see different sports cars that they've singled out. GTO Z16A mid version, of course the Z32, the 80 Supra, NSX NA2 Type S, and I believe this is a Bathurst version of the RX7 FD with the stock wheels, all stock wheels here or optional. And uh, down here he talks about what is the equipment that you need to enjoy sports driving and some useful lights and sunglasses and driving gloves so you can have a nice grip. And here he explains some important things about uh, setting the driving position right. Uh, you have to be upright, but even though these sports cars are very low, it's important to have a very good vision out of the car and not just sit and lean back so you, and you can't see outside. Uh, advertising the SE37, which came out uh, just about the year 2000. Now uh, there's a little mesh design, which is quite different from the PE37. And now the next page here features the Honda S2000, which just came out in 1999, the previous year, and comparing it to the FD3S RX7. This is a shot in the one gun uh, tunnel, uh, very similar to some of the shots that uh, featured the uh, one gun midnight. And how they are talking about how these two cars are very similar as they are lightweight rear wheel drive sports cars with a 50 50. Uh, even weight distribution front and rear and the key differences of the uh, body style uh, RX-7 being a coupe and with a rotary engine it's a very unique one of its kind and the S2000 uh, was Honda's first FR car after a long while and being a convertible or open car as they call it in Japan I uh, guess kind of like pure sports driving uh, experience both cars were also pretty expensive uh, considering uh, the prices of uh, other lower end sports cars. Similar also in weight uh, with the RX-7 being 1,280 kilograms but with 280 horsepower as regulated by the Japanese Gentleman's Agreement. The RX, uh, the S2000 being a lot lower at 1,240 kilos in Japanese spec but with 250 horsepower uh, for the JDM with higher compression. And on this page uh, they interview two, well two sports car owners. Here is a family of father uh, and his two sons who are fairly the Z enthusiasts. Um, they have a S30 and a Z31, both of them, and a lady who has a NA6E Roadster. And they interview them uh, to talk about their experiences and why they love uh, these sports cars. And sometimes you do find in Japan that you know the dad has influenced their kids uh, so much to a point that they start owning the same sports cars. So here the dad has a Z31 and the oldest son as well and they explain how they keep the cars in good condition they go driving together and the younger son has chosen an older model a, a dark brown or maroon S30 and I'm not forgetting that 20 years ago the S30 was a lot cheaper and much more available than today and so were these as well still a little bit cheaper than maybe the uh, Z32 models and this part over here, um, the mum and the wife of or the, the son, and um, how they are very supportive of their husband's uh, hobby, and you know they enjoy car life together. A lot of uh, Japanese wives uh, who do not mind their husband's uh, car enthusiasm uh, do support them quite a lot, and that's very nice to see. Here is a lady who uh, bought this uh, NA MX-5 Roadster, and the interview with the uh, dealer that she bought it from. And she says here that she doesn't go to uh, Toge for driving, but it's more of a lifestyle car. Uh, a lot of ladies are attracted to the open car or convertible design and the cute design of the NA Roadster. And actually in Japan, you can see a lot of these ladies uh, driving these, these cars still uh, for its looks. And so here is where Jay's t gets very interesting because they do talk a lot about uh, the different categorizations of sports car. Now this is a very interesting topic because we can understand from JC Po, uh, from the Japanese point of view, how these sports cars are classified. Now not forgetting that a lot of the models were only available in Japan and so the variety was a lot more and 
this is talking uh, about how they separate the sports cars into these sort of categories. So first up, up here in this corner, uh, it's talking about sports cars that have a lot of power, but are also uh, heavy in weight, but with a big price tag. Sort of singled out the GTO, Mitsubishi GTO um, Z15 and Z16, uh, four wheel steer, four wheel drive, uh, 3000 cc twin turbo engine with probably the highest torque value uh, in the 90s for a sports car. 42.5 kilograms of torque. Even though it had a high tech mechanism, it was considered more like a, a cruiser sort of a highway, uh, but also the occasional toge of car. Also being the flagship of Mitsubishi Motors, uh, not the Lanza Evolution until it was phased out. The A70 Supra and the A80 Supra, of course, this was the flagship of Toyota sports cars in the 90s. Now the Sora was a little bit different because that was considered more like a luxury. It was a Lexus uh, overseas but sold as a Sora in Japan. So the sports tradition uh, touring GT sports car was actually the Toyota Supra. For Nissan, it was the Fair Lady series. So here they featured the Z32, which had a very long running life uh, from 1989 all the way to 2002. The Z31, a model that came before that, um, was also considered a GT car, uh, with a VG30 engine. So this, at this time, was still appreciated. And now here we have the K cars, or cars that were in the um, minor or small category called K, which means lightweight, and uh, micro sports cars. So these are the legendary 90s ABC. A for the AZ1, uh, Mazda, uh, who took the design from uh, Suzuki, actually, and this was a gullwing uh, sports car that used the same engine, mid-mounted, with gullwing doors. The B for the Honda Beat, uh, Honda's very unique uh, mid-engine roadster-type car without turbo, and it could reach 9,000 RPM. A very interesting car, the successor in the S660. But this was an NA engine and still very much collectible. The C for the Suzuki Cappuccino, uh, true FR with uh, the turbo from the Alto Works and was also an open car. So this ABC combination is still very popular today and uh, very much collectible. So here it's talking about the uh, classic 70s or 60s sports cars, uh, the Cosmo Sports, uh, Mazda first rotary engine and of course the legendary Toyota 2000 GT which is really expensive now. Uh, with their crown derived Yamaha design body uh, in line 6, 2 litre. And here we have the uh, other kind of like sort of lightweight mid range sports cars and the singled out the S series, the S500, 600, and 800 uh, for its high performance, uh, even in that category. Uh, the NSX, of course. Uh, being an exotic car and mid-engine along with the MR2 at the lowest scale. The FC and FD uh, 3S, Honda S2000 and of course here you have the complete combination of the uh, RX-7. These cars were much lightweight than the higher power sports cars they were known for handling and so this is another category that they've put it in. On this next page, uh, they're talking about the even lighter uh, sports cars usually about the 1,000 kilogram mark. So uh, this explains that these cars are very lightweight and very fun to drive even though it doesn't have a lot of power. You have to single out the Toyota Sports 800, not as it is Sports 800, which had a two-cylinder boxer engine uh, made in the late 60s. It was very light at 500, uh, 600 kilograms. And this was supposedly one of the founding technical designs for the current uh, FRS 86 and BRZ. Of course, the first generation MR2 AW11, which had the 4AG engine and much lighter weight than the following SW20, which put in another category. So we have also the Roadster, of course, the N8 and NB, and the Toyota MRS, which was close in spirit to the AW11 than the SW20 was, because that had a turbo. So lightweight sports cars, and here we have the older, and uh, more like sort of straight line cruiser type. Notice that they've put the original Fair Lady, uh, not the Fair Lady, this is the Fair Lady Z, and the following model. Uh, not a focus on handling, but more like cruising and just looking good. Of course, this was used in uh, Wanga Midnight, a uh, bit of fictitious stuff, but we're running in a straight line, high speed. But in Japan, these are considered they're just like classic, uh, good looks cruising cars. Here we have uh, super lightweight handmade sports cars. 
uh, the Tommy Kyra ZZ, which is something not very well known, kind of a kit car, sort of like a Lotus, uh, built with a SR20 engine uh, placed uh, in the middle, and uh, the Mitsuoka 01, which is sort of based very loosely on the Caterham 7, a British car, and this was using special tune, which is different, 120 horsepower at 720 kilograms, very, very light. And this category is interesting because you can see here, it shows the Impreza, uh, this is the 22B, so STI rally cars, um, the Lancer Evo will be in this in the here as well, in the Lancer version 6, uh, the Silvia, Celica GT4, Skyline GTR, Mitsubishi Stereon, and the Integra Type R, so the Civic Type R, EG6, all that will be in this category. Now here it says, it's interesting. are these really sports cars? Are these specialty cars? Or is it like, as a Japanese saying, uh, a banana is not a snack. Now, it's interesting to note that they put it in this category because this may be based on a normal sedan, uh, such as the Lancer, Integra, and the Civic, and the Skyline, and the Impreza, of course. Now, the Celica and the Silvia is interesting because even though the design is bespoke, they are designed only as a coupe body, but the base is from a sedan car. So it had things uh, that were similar to the sedan versions, but all these were made for the necessity of homologation and given a much higher performance over the standard model. They had performance and speed that would exceed actually cars in these other categories, but they were more like specialty cars. So they put it in this category because maybe visually and design-wise, they weren't considered true sports cars. But this is how they talk about these uh, and uh, a lot of different categories we've seen other issues. And always uh, this section, uh, they like to uh, go on the street and interview people, uh, usually random people in the street. Uh, they may or may not be uh, sports car lovers. And they ask the general public here in a sort of questionnaire, and what sort of car do you like? And it's interesting here, we can see that already in this, in the 90s to the 2000s, uh, sort of minivans were getting very popular. 18% voted that they would like to buy a one box, as it's called in Japan. Uh, sports cars only 14%, an RV 14%, a sedan 12%, a wagon 26% that was still very popular, and others with 16% ask a combination of uh, like high school girls, uh, young people, uh, just people in the street, Anjin Shibuya. And what we can take away from this that the trend towards sort of lifestyle cars was already, at least in Japan, starting from the 1990s. So you see cars like the CRV being produced and this was due to uh, a lifestyle change. Here's a very interesting advertisement uh, from Spoon Sports, and they did a lot of advertisements in JST and other magazines back in the uh, 80s and the 90s. Here you can see the S2000, uh, they're preparing that uh, to race in the Nürburgring. And some rare photos, you can see here Gran Turismo. Uh, this car also appeared in Gran Turismo uh, 2 and 3 and they're talking about the endurance race and how that's used in their technology for research of parts. And some other pages here, I uh, won't bother to go too much into it. You see here, a very interesting photo of what is a Daihatsu Midget. It's a K-car category, but it's the smallest of the K-cars. It's sort of like a single-seater, a mini pickup, and they actually did a race uh, with this. Very JDM, very quirky, very weird. And this section, uh, in every issue, they talk about uh, the founding model, uh, in this case is the 323 or the Familia, Mazda Familia. This is actually the last Mazda Familia and they highlighted the uh, wagon, sport wagon, the Sport 20, and the very first Familia. They do a comparison and to trace the lineage and technology uh, updates and also uh, give some uh, period correct observations. Um, here's the specs uh, listing how much uh, the first model and the current model has grown. So for example, what is interesting here to see is that of course in the, in the 60s, cars were much smaller and has grown in size. And of course, as you know, the Familiar has become the Mazda 3. It's huge now. But looking at the last Familiar, we can see that in length, it's a difference of 615 millimeters in length, difference of 230 millimeters in width and in height 25 meters, uh, millimeters, sorry. And engine has grown uh, in capacity from a 800cc from the original Familia to a 2000cc and many other details here and is an analysis of exploring the uh, development and thinking of sports cars and on this page 
uh, they talk about the rivals of the Familiar, obviously being in the D segment, uh, you have the Sunny, Corolla, the Impreza, the Civic, and here, ooh, they highlighted the uh, yellow Koki Civic Type R. And uh, this is also a car that you don't often see. It's a Hino Contessa, when Hino still made sports cars back in the day. A side, front, and rear view uh, comparison. Uh, this is something that the Japanese magazines do very often, interior engine and uh, also down here is uh, in the time period of the original car, uh, what was popular. So here they highlighted the Maltz beer, Suntory beer and m some of you may not know this, it looks like Barbie doll, this is a Japanese version called Rikachan and uh, it was sold at what price were they uh, in the past. And another section here uh, is very interesting because uh, they talk about some uh, technical things uh, for viewers to understand uh, from their point of view what is important in car tuning and uh, maintenance stuff. So here it highlights the R33 sedan, uh, the GTS 25T with the RB25 Type M. And it says here, Mazuwa, so in the beginning at first, do an alignment check. Uh, they're talking about how it's very important that whatever modifications you do, and um, it's important to do the alignment first before modifying anything else just to make sure your car is running um, as it's designed very well and uh, having a balanced handling and they talk about uh, what are the procedures of four-wheel computer alignment of course this was not new technology uh, already in the mid 90s uh, they had this computerized alignment already way back then and here in the old car section uh, they highlight the DR30 uh, skyline and always uh, they talk about just some points that you should check what usually occurs uh, in the engine for example uh, the actuator how to solve them and very useful information uh, even with just pictures on how to solve these problems. Now, these cars are really expensive now the 20 years ago they were cheap and as indicated here there's always a U section and let's have, just have a look a little bit a Hakosuka skyline not a GT a GC10 was available at 120, no, this is 1.2 million yen. So that's $12,000, oh my goodness. $20,000 could buy you a S30, unbelievable. Here in the corner, we have a Coupe uh, AE86, 47 months. So that's 4,000 or $5,000. Can you imagine buying it at that price back then? This comic section, Japanese love manga, uh, it explains a little bit about how uh, to do some DIY. Here it's talking about all the catch tank and how to install them. Uh, they use manga as a means of explaining a lot of DIY and giving information. Very common you'll see in Japan. Uh, many kind of comics and manga to explain uh, like history and stuff. Uh, this is much easier for people to absorb and um, get in touch with rather than just all text. So very well drawn out and it's really a serious uh, comic. It's not just for, for fun or jokes and they talk about uh, this as an ongoing issue with another series. This is a very famous tuner. It is Nikura san from Mines uh, Wave. Uh, that's the full company's name. And we featured him in a GT channel video uh, interview him when we went there recently, 20 years ago looking very young, of course, and this section interviews famous tuners, or not just famous tuners, just tuners in general. Of course, uh, Nikura-san being one of the top tuners in Japan, but even 20 years ago, he was already recognized as that. And here he tells his story, which a lot of the content you can see in the video that we made, um, how he started off with uh, doing ECU reprogramming and tuning and here he highlights the R31's ECU from 1987 until the then current R34 uh, ECU and here's his shop in Yokosuka looking very much the same as it is now and uh, so the most famous product are uh, three things it is the VXROM which is still used by some dealers uh, of Nissan cars today it's a uh, completely reprogrammed and to certain settings with light tuning, for example, uh, just exhaust or turbine change. And it's still very much a sought after product. The uh, Esta Suspension Pro, uh, which is probably based on an Olins, as it's stated here, uh, with their special tuning. The Silence VX 
uh, Pro titanium exhaust, which was very new and revolutionary back in the late 90s. So this was featured here along with um, various uh, strut bars and lower arm bars. And uh, it's just an interview for people to know uh, what are the kind of products and services that they can expect. And so here is Jace Tipo's um, house car. And uh, at that time they bought a SXE10 RS200 Altezza. As you can see here, the Beams engine, uh, three SGE, four cylinder. And they show just the progress of how modifications they've made. Looking very nice here, the Z uh, edition. And so of course, here they want to um, do gradual modifications to uh, unleash more potential of the cars. Uh, Best Motoring also did that. They had a Altezza and um, this was actually kind of like a mid-range premium sports car uh, back then. It was not that cheap uh, compared to like a lower sports car. Now it's just really, really cheap. But this is a great engine. It's the last 3SGE. Uh, of course, everyone knows this is the Beams engine. In actual fact, all the Toyota engines at that time had the name Beams, uh, standing for breakthrough in the management of, of something. It's just like a, an intake exhaust, sort of like head cylinder sort of tune. But what was important is that it had dual VVTi. It was the only 3SG to have intake and uh, ex exhaust uh, variable valve timing, come similar to the BMW double Vanos, but for a four-cylinder engine, this was actually the first. Uh, Toyota traditionally had VVTi only on the intake side, so without the use of VTEC, uh, which Toyota has the VVTLi, which came later in the uh, 231 Celica, this was a really strong engine that could sort of compete with Honda cars. Anyway, TRD uh, meters down here, and they talk about how they're trying to get more mid-range uh, torque to the engine, and a lot of modifications that they've done here. And so here they're talking about uh, actually rebuilding the engine and balancing it, blueprinting it more uh, for more response. And so they actually did that step along with uh, a Fujitsubo exhaust manifold to increase torque from 4,500 RPM uh, with a new engine. TRD parts, uh, this was available uh, back then in a huge catalog, the air filter, uh, spark plugs, and some small things like the air filter, uh, sorry, the oil filter, the oil filler cap, thermostat, and the strut bar. The original car doesn't come with a strut bar, but um, you can buy all sorts of bracings from TRD, looking very nice in their gunmetal finish. And one another important thing about the 3SG to improve is the flywheel. Changing the flywheel would give a much better response uh, compared to the dual mass flywheel, which is stock on a lot of Toyotas back then uh, for ease of driving and a better, uh, better clutching, which is used aimed more at uh, middle aged guys. So uh, they explain here how uh, changing this uh, along with the clutch really made a difference in the performance of the 3SG. Uh, flywheel was rated at about five to six kilos from off the market manufacturers, which half the weight of the dual mass flywheel. Uh, about 12 kilos from the manufacturer. I had one before and this car, uh, the engine although it was very strong, it was really lethargic compared to Honda engines. So set here, uh, change everything and along with the TRG engine mount and this would actually transform a sort of a soft sports car and the, like the Altezza in order to make it more uh, competitive with Honda sports cars. So we hope you enjoyed that review of our magazine and let us know in the comments uh, what other kind of series you'd like us to review if you have any suggestions and or maybe some of the uh, model cars and that we have in my collection right here. So until next time, thanks for joining in. Peace out.